I'm excited to share pause with you and I feel like it's kind of more fun when you pass stuff around. I'm, I'm passing around this sign-in sheet and I'll have things like um, a, a feedback survey so I can improve and be better for the next group I'm with. And I'll pass the book around too, but we will, raffle, we will have this um, go to one of you at, towards the end of, in, um, in some way. So I'm excited to share what I've got. Uh, but feel free to th thumb through it. Uh, I live in San Francisco, so I'm not too far from home. I spent the day pausing <laughs> in uh, skiing in Squaw, which was really fun for me. So uh, it's an honor to be here with you and, and sharing more of my story. Today our theme, as you can see, is learning the three, sta three, three strategies for techies, but that really means kind of a bigger umbrella for leaders and entrepreneurs and techies uh, to take high stress or overwhelm or burnout or not feeling so good, maybe you're stuck or in a rut, uh, into thriving and it's actually possible. So just a show of hands here, kind of getting the feel for, for you guys. Uh, who here is an entrepreneur? All right, that's like at least half of you, that's great. And who would consider yourself a techie? <laughs> like everybody, almost. <laughs> How about um, a leader? Everybody's a leader, yeah. I'm a leader. We're all leaders in our lives, I think. Uh, and, then, and then, like, other. <laughs> like, I don't know. There's always a good, there's always a, there's always a good way to, uh, to frame that, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, go ahead and just, like, if you can, raise one hand. And if you can't raise it high, just, like, raise it in front of you. But just go ahead and raise one hand. And if you can, extend your arm out. Rotate nine degrees. Give a high five and say, you got here. You made it. Good job. Good job. And Dennis made it to the front row. I'm like so thrilled. <laughs> Nobody ever wants the front row, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, and so one of the things we'll be doing today, which I think is kind of fun, is uh, accelerated learning. Has anyone heard of accelerated learning? Yeah, so it's kind of like this way to learn and grow that makes it really interactive and embodying, meaning like we use our bodies and repeat stuff back. So I might be doing some weird stuff up here, but the idea is it's more fun and ideally uh, you get more out of it, I get more out of it as we go forward and then engage. Cool, so uh, giving you a little bit of the, the, the state of, of what I'm talking about, as you know now, a little bit about me, I wrote a book. Uh, I live in San Francisco, I, I work at Google. Um, and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end, but the idea is that everything I'm sharing today uh, is essentially based on my own experience from uh, burning out at Google <laughs> six years ago. So I'll get more into that when I share my story. But the idea is that the tools that I'll share, and I have, I have these three strategies, uh, you, can, you can actually implement these really quickly today, tonight, have like your own pause plan. And uh, if I can do it, I'm pretty sure all of you can do it, and you don't need to take a, like I took a three-month unpaid break. So, um, so that's the way we'll, we'll be rolling today. And just for a time check, because I, I actually forgot my phone. This was a funny story. I, uh, what time is it, Shivani? It's 6.12. Okay, cool. So I know we wrap at 7, and we'll have time for Q&A. But uh, I forgot my phone. I, I drove up Sunday, because I, I have a ski chair up in Tahoe Donner this year. And I was like, wow, I could either go home and get the phone, or I, it was about 20 minutes outside of San Francisco. I just crossed the Golden Gate, or the Golden Gate, the, um, the Bay Bridge. I was like, no, like this is me living my my work, which is a d digital device pause. So I actually haven't had a phone, and I, and I took two days off of work, but uh, I was like really proud of myself. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I don't have to have a phone, but that's not always the case, and I, I did cheat. I had laptop use yesterday and, and today, <laughs> so that was good. All right, so who here has ever felt like this woman <laughs> in the last 24 hours? <laughs> Keep your hands up. In the, in the, last, uh, in the last two hours? Or who feels like this right now? Yeah, so I mean, this is, this is kind of like how we live our lives, and I call it a state of being. So pausing, which I'll get into, pausing is a state of being. So will you turn to someone and say, pausing is a state of being? <laughs> right, right, so pausing is a state of being, and the idea is it doesn't have to be some long, drawn-out time away from anything. But if you actually have the idea of it being a way of living, it can be something as, as a way of life, and that's kind of what I, I'll be getting into today. So I'm gonna share these three strategies. I won't get into them too much, and I'll talk about my story. I think it's, it's, it's relevant. And then we'll actually create our own pause plan. So you guys have a couple pieces of paper in front of you, and 
I think there's some pens, but we'll be coming up with a couple things that you could walk out of here and implement tonight by bedtime, which is pretty exciting. And you know, knowing that state of being, and if you're pulling your hair out, uh, they could potentially change how you go about your day or your night, moment by moment. And all right, so my story, I think, is is uh, highly relevant to all of this because I think uh, I'll take you a little bit far back about like I said, about six years ago, I was at Google in San Francisco. And I was managing a customer support team. So I had a team of people. And I uh, was doing a bunch of stuff at the time. But I just felt like I was banging my head against a wall. Has anyone ever felt like that? Like It's, it's like a human condition sometimes. And uh, I was the envy of all my friends. They thought I had this great job. And, and on paper, I did. But I felt like a failure. And I, for no matter what I tried, I felt like I wasn't doing as well as my manager was thinking I could do. And I felt mentally drained almost daily because I'd come into work and I'd want to be trying harder and I'd want to be doing better and, I, and I'd go for it. And then I would just get some feedback that I wasn't, wasn't uh, communicating well or I didn't have executive presence and so on and so forth. So this didn't work out so great for me. I thought, what, what, what happened? Like, I thought I was doing really well here. Can anyone relate to this, by the way? Just make, maybe, maybe not? Yeah, I see a couple hands go up. So I also consider myself in a, a, an overachiever. So who here would say, yeah, I'm a, maybe in that category? I actually, I'm, I call myself a recovering achiever now <laughs> because I, uh, I've checked off so many boxes, I feel like I'm now in like reme remedial doing things without lists sometimes, although I still love my lists. But I, I have an MBA. I was a national rowing champion for about five times. I lived in New York City. I worked at Google. I lived in San Francisco. So like the boxes were there, and I kept checking them off. However, I was, I was not very happy. I felt really sad a lot of the time. I cried a lot of the time. Actually, I was, at the time, I had a boyfriend who um, tried to cheer me up. Has anyone heard of the House of Air? Does anyone know that in San Francisco? Oh, it's, so it's, it's actually a big indoor park of trampolines. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> kids go there all ages. And, and it was the first time I remember laughing, like really belly laughs, like this is fun. So I kind of like touched that. But for the most part, I really wasn't happy. And uh, my manager pretty much gave me this ultimatum to decide if I wanted to stay in the role, kind of like figure things out, or most likely, what, if, I, if I really wanted to, to like succeed at Google, I probably could find, should find something else. So I was like, well, this isn't going so great for me. And I got that message on a Friday. I went home for the weekend, and I Skyped the next day with two good friends of mine. And one of them just happened to mention, and I explained the situation to them, and one of them mentioned, doesn't Google have a sabbatical program or a leave of absence program? And it was like this light bulb went off in my head. And I, I, was, I, was, I thought, I think they might. I actually don't know. <laughs> so I researched it. And sure enough, we did. And uh, only 14% of global companies, by the way, offer any kind of paid or unpaid break. And that's from the Society of Human Resource Management. But just, a, just like a little side note in there, if you're, a, if you're an entrepreneur, uh, you know, it's growing. But there's just super small amount. And it's only 4% who offer paid. So uh, fortunately enough, Google was one of those companies. And I, I, made, a, I made my pitch to my manager on the Monday morning. And, and sure enough, I got approval. And I got human resources to approve it. So I felt really lucky. And I chose to spend those three months uh, actually just being and not doing for a change. And that was really hard for me. So I didn't know if I would return to Google. But I focused on being more present. And, and to me, I really didn't know what that meant other than I just needed to to decompress a little bit because the whatever I was doing wasn't working for me. So I chose to do a couple things like look at my strengths and ask my friends, like, what do you think I'm good at? Because I clearly am not really sure anymore. And I don't, I don't really feel like my mental state is helping me know that. <laughs> I took the Strength Finders assessment uh, online, which maybe some of you know about. It's a great tool from the Gallup. And it's like 20 bucks. And you can have all your strengths kind of outlined including what careers are good for you. And, and I, I just focused on not traveling. I could have done all these other plans. I actually rented a home, a friend's house, for two months in Tahoe just to come out for the weekends during the summer. And, and that was like a great place for me to kind of just get that space. So I decided to return to Google. Here I am still there. 
but life was really different after I came back. And, and part of it was what I learned on my pause was just to be more present and to be a little more self-aware. I mean, really, that's, that's what I learned, if I had to summarize it. And so I started doing things differently at Google. I, was, I actually looked for a new role and got a new job in sales based on what my strengths were. And then I also did some things that I thought were more like following my yearnings. And we'll talk about those. But things like hosting authors to speak at Google was out of me wanting to bring conscious messages to other people in the world and at Google and, uh, and enjoying that, even though it added a lot more to my daily tasks and logistic planning and stuff. But I got a lot out of it. I also, uh, I also started doing things like mindfulness and meditation, which I'd never had heard of before, this pause, and went to Burning Man <laughs> for, for one week. I know you guys know what that is, and, and that was a big, uh, big revelation that I didn't have to put myself in this box, basically. I didn't have to live this life in a box that I, myself and my parents and the whole system I was in um, put me in. So, uh, <laughs> so, so fast forward till now, and... Uh, yeah, I took a, a weekend class a couple of years ago as well when I came back in emotional intelligence in Chicago out of the Wright Foundation and ended up doing a so coaching certification there two years ago. And I'm still in classes there every Monday night. I have a transformation lab I'm a part of. So there's just been a lot on, this, on my journey. And um, the idea is that if I, can, if I can learn this, anyone can also turn that type of a situation into what serves you more and it doesn't have to be a long break and, and, and so think back to a time where maybe you felt the same where where you've been in a rut or you haven't felt completely adequate in whatever you're doing and and that's that's all good but also know that uh, it doesn't have to be a big long break you can learn these tools and I'm bringing in the tools from the book and I wrote the book after I returned to Google over a course of five years doing it on the weekends and I felt like I really wanted to help people learn these tools that I'd been learning in emotional and social learning uh, and what I learned on my pods without going through some big breakdown or like a big catastrophic event like me being managed out of the business. So I invite you all to kind of think about it like that. And, and the idea is this can be a lifestyle that pause is a state of being really, I think, does make my, well, makes my heart sing, but it also, I think, makes a lot of sense because things just, the way they're going, I can't think they are going to continue in that way where people are feeling really fulfilled and satisfied. Um, you know, thinking about your own lives, there might be things in there that you're like, yeah, maybe this could be different. So that's a little bit about my story. And that brings us to the first key strategy, which is, it's really not a, not a, um, a big uh, surprise, but knowing that pausing is okay. So um, what's the first strategy, please? Very good. Yes. Good job. You just practice accelerated learning again. Uh, and this statistic on here basically tells us um, a lot of truth that we probably all know. More than half of Americans feel overworked or overwhelmed at least 70%, um, at least some of the time, and 70% say they dream of having another job. So because we're in this kind of like a good little container here, um, does that resonate with anyone? Like, I know, I'm just curious myself, like, being in, being where you live, I know you're not in, like, a, a, like, crazy, like, city craziness, so, like, are, like, like, who here feels satisfied with what they're doing right now? Who feels like they could be living a more satisfied and meaningful life, even more, <laughs> even if you're satisfied? Satisfied but overworked. Satisfied but overworked, yeah. So the key is being, being more satisfied while you're working. And so I define a pause as any intentional shift in behavior. So what is a pause, please? Any intentional shift in behavior. You guys are good. I feel like I have a class. Uh, correct. So that means it, can, it doesn't have to be a long period of time. It's not tied to money, time, or activity. But it's essentially a way that you can engage in the world, whether it's a pause or a conversation or you take a risk that may not be something you normally do and causes you to shift. And that is really important because a lot of people don't really notice this, but pausing is a choice. And if you think about pausing as an intentional shift in behavior, that's about intention. And, and so we're all, all the time thinking about autopilot and, be, and living in this autopilot world more than 90, 95% of our daily, daily lives. And that's just being in our normal world of human beingness. This is another interesting statistic. I'll read it out loud. 72% of executives wouldn't take additional vacation days 
even if they were unlimited. However, about four in ten, about yeah, four in ten, thirty-nine percent think output would actually increase if employees took the time off. So, well, what is that? And to me, this this is actually very telling because it's saying we know better, right? We know better. And this is what I call the pause paradox in that we think that we value the sustainable culture, we value sustainable and profits, just most of the Western culture does, uh, but we do not expect the time to create, um, create the time to refresh and renew. It's just like right now in historical times and the way of our industrial revolution, like this just hasn't been what we do. And it's actually really counterintuitive and, the, and you think it's the last thing you should do, <laughs> right? Uh, and Dr. Shelley Carson here from Harvard, she shares quite good information, I think. A distraction may provide the break you need to, in, to disengage from a fixation in the, in a, uh, on, on the ineffective solution. So it's actually saying if you pause, if you choose to intentionally shift your behavior, get away from what's going on, you actually could be more efficient. You actually could come up with a solution that you haven't found yet. And isn't that interesting? You know, we think about, I, you know, the mentality of, Others, what will someone think of me or the fear of not having a plan? Well, the idea is that you can shift and choice. Again, it comes down to the choice, but the idea is that you are not a slacker, even though people think like that's the perception. And the idea, again, is uh, it's about your choices. And I always say pausing is in service to the doing. Like, that's kind of the, the way that this, I think, works. So good reflective questions here, just kind of thinking about it, you know, the price that we pay, the prices you pay as an individual, your family, the culture, the, as, us as a society is pretty big. What is it you pay without pausing? And, and, I, and, and then how can pausing best serve you? And there's lots of ways. I think pausing is for everyone, like I said before. Maybe it's a passion project that you just haven't spent enough time on or a new endeavor or a business idea that you've had a spark on but you haven't taken action. In what ways can you be even more successful and happy through pausing? And again, it's, it's about these incremental steps, trying something maybe daily, and creating something to integrate that, that helps bring you that more meaning and satisfaction. And that brings us to my second tip strategy, which is to honor and follow your yearnings. So what's the second step, please? Yeah. So what, what the heck is a yearning? <laughs> it's like this old English term, like people kind of use it, but it doesn't mean that much maybe, right? Mm. What's that? Passion, yeah, like a hunger. It's like, like these are all seven billion of us on the planet, most of us will have what we call <coughs> these deep down hungers and they're universal. So if we can choose and know what we yearn for, and again, this takes a little effort, it's choice and conscious effort, then we can actually honor those to move towards them and be more satisfied. But the, here's, the, here's the catch. They get really tripped up with the surface level wants, and I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. But here are some of these universal yearnings, and the list is way bigger than this, but just take a look at that and maybe some of these pop out at you, like really resonate, and maybe they all do. Uh, but the idea is that yearnings are something that we aren't really in touch with day to day because we're just not talking about it or maybe we're not even conscious of it. And the first step is to actually be aware of it. Our dopamine system doesn't have satiety, sati sati can't say it, <laughs> thank you, satiety built into it, <coughs> tongue tied. So we can never truly be satisfied by our wants. Our cravings for our soft addictions. It is only when we pursue our yearnings that we activate the satisfaction centers of our brains and experience true fulfillment. And that's a quote from her book, Soft Addictions. So the idea is that yearnings go hand in hand with pausing, in my opinion. And the idea is that when you do pause, it's a chance to check in with your yearnings. And there's even another way to do this, and I, don't, I, I didn't put the slide up for time, but it's called the So That Test. So if you're having trouble finding a yearning, because this is like a new skill we're building, right? We have to learn how to know what we yearn for. The so that test is to just start at any want. So um, if, any, like if, if anyone wants to volunteer a want, I'll take it. But like anyone out there? It's like, I want a new house. I want money. Money is a great one, because we all want money. 
So I want money. Okay, so then you say, so, so I want money so that dot, dot, dot. And you fill that in three times. You kind of dig down deeper. And by the third time, you'll get to your yearning most likely. So I want money so that dot, dot, dot. What? Do you want to volunteer? So that I can do the work I want to do. So you can do the work you want to do. I want to do the work I want to do so that dot, dot, dot. So that I can make a difference. I can make a difference. Oh, well, isn't that a yearning? You only needed two for that one, right? Um, so the yearning is to make a difference. And so once you can tap into that yearning, it's actually not about what and how you fulfill it. But if you actually engage to fulfill it, you can feel more satisfied, have more meaning. And this is a moment-by-moment -moment opportunity. So these happen thousands of times a day, just like emotions in our body. And when we can actually be more aware of this, it will lead to more engagement at work, having more meaning, and avoiding all those surface level wants. I mean, they're still going to happen because we are creatures of habit and we love our phones and dopamine's triggering us and all of that. But uh, the idea is, again, pausing is a choice and you can choose to shift your behavior intentionally. Does that make sense? That's a very good key insight and um, something that's totally changed my life. So the third strategy is experimenting with what I call daily pauses. So in Pause the Book, there's all kinds of different pauses. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of them um, that are even longer called extended pauses or forced pauses when you're laid off. But we're going to focus on the daily pauses today. And kind of this goes all back to that pause paradox and that always on isn't working. And um, I'm sure all of you know here from, from living in the area, like there's a lot of value from pausing, right? Whether you're out in the, in the nature or um, just away from the hustle and bustle or creating your own space is really important. And, uh, and I think this is a good, good data point as well. By distancing yourself from a challenge and taking the perspective of an observer, you can enhance your reasoning leading to insights and new solutions that hadn't occurred to you before. And that's from psychological science. And uh, I think we all know this on some level. But once we see it, and like, we can like, kind of register it in this, in this uh, cerebral capacity, it can change how we are in the world. At least, you know, that's the idea. <laughs> so here's some ideas for daily pauses. And if any of these jump out at you, you might want to take note of that. And we can add it to your pause plan. That's what I like doing every day. Yeah, this guy's really happy <laughs> at work. <laughs> I was thinking, like, who is like that here? I don't know. Uh, he's very happy, yeah. So, so I, I, I think this is one of my favorites. And, and does anyone here practice meditation or mindful attention training in some way? OK, so like, a, like maybe like half of you. Um, so the belly breath pause, some of you know this. And it's, you know, we all know how to breathe. But the idea is if you even put like one hand on your diaphragm and just take a breath. I'm going to do it now. Inhaling through my mouth, nose and exhaling through my mouth. I mean, that, that's a pause. Uh, and you can build up to 10 breaths if you don't do any of those things. Or you can just keep adding and expanding your capacity and your breath. I'm also a big fan of digital device pauses. I call these DDPs, digital device pauses. I mentioned I was on one inadvertently because I forgot my phone. And I've actually had a lot of fun like thinking about how many times I, knew, I was like, I, I don't have my phone. I probably counted like hundreds of times that I, that happened. Uh, but this is an interesting statistic as well. I'm going to move over here so I can read it. And here are, the, here are those neurotransmitters again. When we check our devices, the neurotransmitter dopamine gets released, which helps control the brain's reward and pleasure centers. We feel good as the physiological response to dopamine in our brain's pleasure center lights up. So when we're thinking, like, I can't put the phone down, or I want to check this thing, and I mean, we're wired that way. So it's, it's, not, it's not a personal thing. I mean, this is how we're all working through technology. And the reality is, like, always on isn't working. It's up to us to make those choices to be different. And it takes a lot of effort. I know that <laughs> firsthand. Uh, but creating these rules and limits are, I think, really important. And this is what I did on my pause. So when I took that three months unpaid break, I made up rules and boundaries for what to do. And this was really the first time in my world that I, that I tried this. But a couple of my rules were uh, from the digital device side was to check email only 30 minutes a day. So I I'd usually go to a coffee shop. Another rule I had was to leave the house by 10 <laughs> and make my bed. But, uh, but those, those helped me actually be more disciplined. Because when you go from a really structured world like work and then you go out of that, you need structure, right? I see James nodding. I'm like, yeah, I need that. 
So the idea is that uh, if you just create a couple of these for yourself, it's really important. Um, it might be like, uh, we call it time chunking it, right? But it's, it's like time blocks. And you can, you can set up 30 minutes, or maybe it's device-free zone, so you don't have your phone in the bedroom when you sleep, and you decided to put the night dimmer on, which is a great way to reduce the blue light from your phone after 8 p.m. Uh, and then things like disruption, disruption at, at meal times, and, and just all these things that we that know are common sense, but we just maybe don't, we are not that intentional about it. And the idea is that we can be intentional, it's just a choice. <laughs> well, well, the thing, well, the thing is with, um, with, all of, with all of these, it's an experiment, and that's what I think about when I think of pausing. It's, it's like an experiment in finding what works for you. So what might work for you might not work for you, and it might work for me, but it might not work for Dennis, and this, it, it, this all depends. Um, but the idea is to give things a try, experiment. And this type of pause is also a favorite. I did this one skiing today like a hundred <laughs> times. But expressing gratitude. Uh, is anyone here a gratitude expresser? Just like maybe a couple times a day or journaling? Um, think of one thing today and you can build your list up to 10. But the other thing I think is interesting is, you know, go do it for everything that comes to mind, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, um, I didn't, get a, I didn't get a job at Google last week, and, and like, but I'm grateful for it because now I can really focus on pause. <laughs> you know, like stuff like that. Um, so, so gratitude is one of the best ways we can, we can really monitor um, intentional shifts in behavior too. And then one minute mindful pauses are helpful. This can be something like brushing your teeth, but like really noticing this, the physiological senses, like, like the bubbles in your mouth and like, like how does it feel on your teeth and your gums? And doing that actually doesn't add any time. It's things you would normally be doing, walking to the <coughs> store, what mindful walking. Um, and again, it's about what works for you. I'm a big fan of journaling. Is anyone a, a journaler in here? So when, yeah, when we write things down, there was actually a study done where uh, a group of students wrote for two minutes a day for four days about an emotional experience. So two minutes a day for four days. So that's like a total of, uh, what is that, eight minutes, right? And they found that their uh, level of happiness improved and their emotional response improved. Um, they were actually felt like they were, had more meaning in their lives. Because that's a conscious way we're changing how we think about things when we write. It's pretty fascinating. So we all kind of know this at this point, but uh, pausing does matter. And it's not, it's not something to make you out to be a slacker. But the benefits of returning refreshed after pausing are worth the time away. And that's my main point here tonight is um, even more creativity and less stress happens. And that's from psychology today. And uh, there's much more I could say on that subject, but I think you get the point. And speaking of leaders, so, uh, you know, a leader, we're, all, we're leading our lives all the time, whether it's work or as, you, as, you, as in your personal life. But the idea is that pausing can also increase your own emotional EQ, your emotional intelligence. And um, Daniel Goleman, who wrote Emotional Intelligence in 1996, and these are the five categories of emotional intelligence that he talks about. And when like, there's so much research out there, I'm sure you've all heard it, where if we are increasing our emotional intelligence, we're increasing our capacity as leaders. And it's the number one desired skill right now um, for any type of leadership in any job. <laughs> so it's, it's important and, and pausing to me is a way to cue into that and just say, what am I feeling right now? And they're tied to yearnings, you know, what, what oh, I'm, I notice I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling, and all the emotions are okay. It's just kind of like relearning that a little bit as adults. Um, tuning in versus knee jerking and then again it goes back to being more satisfied and this is moment by moment. So it's like when you make that split second decision, split second decision to eat lunch at your desk or to go out, that's a, cho that's a choice point. You could choose to pause. You could choose to do something. And, and, and you know, we're creatures of habit, so it really takes intention. But accountability is a lot of reasons why we succeed. So maybe there's a buddy right now you could like learn about and find so that that could, could happen. So a lot of that is really the core of what I wanted to get across today. As a kind of wrap up here, we've got three strategies we've talked about. And there are many more, but I think these three are a good way to start. So what's number one? It's okay to pause, right? That's for the first step is just the awareness. Oh, I can pause. Bust through that pause paradox. Choose consciously. Uh, getting off autopilot is, is half the battle. Uh, continue to build up those yearning and uh, emotional intelligence school skills, which is number two. 
identify your yearnings and follow them. So it's a whole new universe can open up once you tap into that. And then what's number three? Experiment. Experiment. Yes, it's all experimenting. So it's about um, the growth mindset here. So you know, what can you do differently? Carol Dweck's work. Experiment with types of pauses stretching out of your comfort zone. And my challenge to all of you tonight is to implement your pause plan in some way by bedtime. You know? Implement it by some way that you, did, you take one small step or one action step that moves you closer. There's actually a, we call it the law of little things. This is Bob Wright's work. Uh, well, it's not his work, but we talk about it. So the law of little things is about the incremental steps that get you somewhere from A to B, but it happens over time, and it's very gradual, almost to the point where you don't even notice it's happening. Can anyone relate to that? Uh, and a visual reference for that is, is the Grand Canyon. So the Grand Canyon is this magnificent geological structure where rain is you know, funneled through in hundreds of miles, thousands of feet deep. And the reality is that happened over millions of years and raindrops falling. And there you go. You got the Grand Canyon. So I invite you to think about that. When you're thinking about change, it is a gradual process. Habits do not change overnight. But incremental steps can help get to, to where you want. Does that make sense? One of the things that I also will share with you are, are what we call implementation intentions. <laughs> implementation intentions are if-then statements. So if, it's, uh, if I'm closing one project, then dot, dot, dot. Then I go outside for five minutes. And they are so important to take new habits seriously. So uh, you could create an if-then or multiple if-then statements for yourself. And all of you, I, I challenge you too, to... Uh, Create one if-then statement to kind of take this to heart so that you can, you can implement it. But the idea is that, let's say you don't do it. So um, if it's the end of a project and, oops, I forgot, I didn't do my, um, my five-minute pause outside, what's the consequence? So give yourself a consequence. Uh, my consequence is that I, I know, here's one. I'll po I post on Facebook that I didn't go outside for lunch today. I mean, if that, felt, if that makes you don't like, like want to change your habits. Um, it could be something like I call my mom and tell her, like, um, I'm, I, I don't know, whatever, I didn't eat my lunch. <laughs> um, but the idea is that it works for you, and the idea is that it'll motivate you to change. And we have to build those in. Otherwise, our brains are too smart. They will not allow you to change. They just want to stay the, the same. And they're important to, to make any changes happen. So I invite you to try an implementation in, intention. And so you can also, anyone can get the first two chapters of PAUSE on my website. You can opt in at rachelamera.com. My email's up there. I'm sorry I don't have any cards. I'm actually out. Um, but you can follow me on Twitter, and you can purchase Pause or um, the audio. It's also an audio book and Kindle. I read it. It's exciting. <laughs> it's in a studio for two days straight um, at bit.ly uh, slash pause the book or just Amazon. You can Google that. Thank you so much for hosting me today. It's an honor.